Storm uh, Limitless Festival. Uh, welcome to my friend Laura Hancock. Come and join us, Laura. Now, Laura, um, Laura works for Youth for Christ as, as, as their uh, director of national ministries. Uh, Laura is a mum of two beautiful children and a husband. No, she's not husband. No. Wife to a, I was going to say to a beautiful husband. Yeah, he is beautiful. Be he is beautiful. Hi, Andy. Uh, and both Laura and Andy uh, are also part of our, our Limitless Leadership team. And uh, so privileged, so excited to hear from Laura tonight. So as we've done before, friends, why don't you join me in praying for Laura? Just reach out your hand towards Laura. And we say, Thanks. Heavenly Father, thank you for Laura. We thank you for all the preparation that she's put in uh, to tonight, how she's listened to you. Uh, we know she's got a, a word from you for us on our hearts. So we mm. pray that you'd help her uh, to speak it as you want it to be spoken. And I pray that you'd help us to receive it as you want us to receive it in the name of Jesus. Mm. Amen. Amen. Lovely. How are we? Yeah? Are you sure? Are we all right? Wow. How's day three been? Anybody, who did the paint thing earlier? The paint with the powder everywhere. I was walking around thinking, how did powder get there? It is all over the site. Well done, guys. You distributed your powder very well. Um, also, little disclaimer, I have dribbled water down my shorts just backstage. So if I haven't wet myself, if you see water on my legs, I just dribbled some water. Down. It will dry as I chat. We'll be fine. Um, it is such a delight to be with you guys this evening. I'm so, so happy. And uh, in the evenings, on the last two evenings, we've been talking uh, about the practice and about the presence. And we've been talking about different revivals that have happened and where God has stirred something in a nation and done something incredible. And I'm going to be disappointingly predictable and do exactly the same thing. I want to talk about a revival that happened. And this revival that I'm going to talk about this evening, it happened in northern Iraq um, quite, quite a long time ago. And it happened in a city there. And what was really significant is this was a massive city. Loads and loads of people lived there. But not only that, um, it was a really big city. Like, it was about 60 miles across. And for those of you who live around the London area or have been around London, the M25 is about 20 miles around the edge of London. So if you think that this is 60 miles across, this is a significantly sized place. And God did something amazing there. It was a really influential city. And um, like the army was out of there and they trained and dispatched army members from there. Um, and it is the only revival in recorded history where everybody turned to follow God. Like from the city leaders and the, the city governors right down to like the, 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 the poorest people in that city, everyone turned to follow God. And I want to talk about that because... The reason I love this revival so much isn't just that everybody came to know God, but the person God used to bring about that revival was, well, I'm going to say a little underwhelming. He wasn't that impressive. And I love that because I love talking about revival. I love talking about what God does, what his power does and his presence does and what the practicing uh, the things of God does in a place. But often I look at revivals and I just think, the people who God tends to use seem to know what they're doing. Could God possibly use someone like me? And so tonight we're looking at the presence of God, but often it's not God's presence in a situation that I doubt. Actually, it's mine. God has got this to work with. I mean, I've just told you that I've spilt water down my leg just as I got on stage. Like, this is what God's got to work with here. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. I appreciate the affirmation. <laughs> but that's the thing. We are so normal. I doubt, don't doubt God's presence or power at all. But he has got me to work with. Guys, this, uh, the city was called Nineveh. And the guy who God used was called Jonah. And I want to talk about him a little bit this evening. But before we go there, have we got any Marvel fans in the house? Whoa! Man, I wasn't expecting such a big response. That's awesome. Anybody really hate Marvel? <laughs> yes, love it. It's passionate, right? People don't feel neutral towards Marvel. I want to talk about Marvel just for a minute. My husband, my beautiful husband, Andy. Uh, I don't know if we're, how do you feel about me describing you as beautiful. You're okay with that? So own it. My beautiful husband, Andy. He doesn't like Marvel. He's not about Marvel. 
Sorry, babe. <laughs> uh, wear a disguise going out. Um, he's not into it. So I've only really recently like, found my own space to be watching the Marvel films. And I've found, and this could be controversial, I might be getting booed with you. Um, who knows who this is? Katie, if you could, yeah, who knows who this is? Oh, okay, let's do this. Yeah, yeah, this is fun. Let's play this game. If you like Marvel and you know who this is, make the noise that this person makes you feel. Yeah, this is fun. Okay. So if you're booing, I'm with you. She does my face in. Ah, what is it about her? Right, this is Captain Marvel, for those of you who don't know. She can pretty much do everything. She, there's no, like, limits. So she can just do what she wants. And, by the way, not a good team player. She's the kind of superhero who can turn up if she has time and if she's not busy and won't really bother explaining where she's been. And, by the way, I'm not going to wreck any plot twists, but there was something fairly significant they could have used her for and they could have done with her help. Did she turn up? No, she didn't. Did anyone question it? No, they didn't. She is not my favourite. Who knows who this is? of the galaxy. These are my kind of people. If I was going to be part of a superhero team, this would be them. For those of you who don't know Marvel, I love Guardians of the Galaxy. It's one of my favorites. These guys, not only do they have an epic soundtrack to any saving the universe that they do, but these guys are a mess. They get it wrong. They say the wrong thing. They do the wrong thing. They're kind of silly. If I was going to be a superhero, this is the kind of superhero I'd be with these guys. And I'm going to level with you. The reason I like them is because I get them. I'm the kind of person who gets things wrong. I'm the kind of person who pours water down my shorts just before I get on stage. This is what I'm about. And so if they're the kind of people that can save the universe, I think, sign me up. That sounds fun. And at the same time, I read the story of Jonah in the Bible, and I think if God can use someone like Jonah, maybe he can use someone like me because I get him. I understand what he's about. And maybe God's presence is greater than my presence in any situation that he wants to take me into. So let's start with Jonah 1 verse 1. Here we go. Oh, by the way, before we go there, if you've got a bottle of water or a drink, could you just have some for me? Just as a favor. I don't want people dehydrating on me, thinking people are like passing out and it's, it's Jesus doing something and actually you're just fainting. So if you could have some water, that would be great. Right, while you're doing that, I'm going to read Jonah 1 verse 1. Here we go. The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. Now, I told you a bit about Nineveh before. Nineveh at the time had a lot of people living in it. It had about 120,000 people living in it. Not a big deal now, massive deal then. It, had, it was about 60 miles wide. It says in the Bible it took about three days to travel across Nineveh. Like this was a really, really, really big city. But these people were mean, really mean. Like I don't know, please don't shout names. Definitely don't point at anyone. Don't do that. But I don't know if you've got someone in your school or in your year group and it just feels like they're a bit mean. And they're the kind of people, I had them in my year. Don't, don't shout names, don't point at anyone. Please, please, please. In my, in my year... You guys go, yeah, it's them, it's them. You know it's them, don't you? Yeah, it's them. Uh, in, my, in my year at school, there were these people who Jesus deeply loves, but whenever they walked into a room, everyone just knew they were there. Like, they'd be, like, on the edge of your conscience, because you, consciousness, because you weren't quite sure what they were going to say, you weren't quite sure who they were going to punch, and you weren't quite sure if they were going to shout at you. So as soon as they walked into the room, everyone's, like, just aware that these people are in the room because they feel a bit dangerous. And this is what the Assyrians were like. Now, Assyria is where Nineveh was. And the Assyrians were like this to the Israelite people. They were the, they were the guys that were mean. And as the Israelites kind of grew up as a nation, the Assyrians were the people that the Israelites always had an eye on, were always a little bit worried about, because they always did stuff to the Israelites that were really mean. So uh, there are stories of them like capturing cities and capturing people and just torturing the people they captured. They'd cut out people's tongues or like squash people with statues or one of their favorite pastimes. If they captured a city, they'd get the heads of the people they captured, stick them on a stick, and they'd be a decoration at dinner that evening. 
lovely, lovely. This is who we're dealing with. Ninevites, they were mean. And so, God says to Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go and tell them about me. I want you to go and tell them how good I am. And I'm going to go and just, I'm going to destroy their city if they don't change their ways. And Jonah's response to this is epic. Are you ready? Jonah 1 verse 3. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket, went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Now, I have a map. I want to show you what we're talking about here. Joppa is where Jonah lived. Nineveh, 550 miles away. Tarshish, 2,500 miles away. And by the way, a beautiful holiday resort at the time. God says to Jonah, I want to use you to start a revival. I want to start you, send you into a city to change a city that might change a nation that could change the world. And Jonah's response, nah, I think I'm just going to go on holiday, thanks. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, really, I'm not really into it. But the thing is, I get it. I totally get it, because he was scared. If I said to you, right, first week back at school in September or college, what I want you to do is go in and just tell everybody, tell everybody, you better change what you're doing, God's mad with you, and he's, he's not going to be best pleased if you don't. You'd be scared. Well, what are they going to say? What are they going to do? Am I going to get hurt? How is this going to go? Honestly, as well, I think he would just rather God had sent somebody else. Me? Really? Me? What about them? They do a great job. And honestly, really honestly, I think Jonah kind of liked the idea of the Ninevites getting destroyed. I think he was kind of open to it because they were mean and he'd always known them as mean and he wasn't that keen on God saving them in the first place. And it sounds ridiculous, but I hear it in us. Um, Andy and I, we have been at our church for around 12 years. We've kind of volunteered with the youth group in that capacity. Like, hey guys. Uh, We've kind of volunteered with the youth group for for 12 years on and off. And Andy used to be the youth pastor there. And uh, there was a time, a long time ago, where where we were like, right, we need to really help our our guys understand what it means to share their faith and why. So we like sat them down. And I remember sitting and chatting to some of the young people in our youth group who have grown up and are long gone now. I was like, guys, be really honest with me. What is it about sharing Jesus that just like (laughs) gives you the heebie-jeebie? He's like, what is it that you just, you're not up for? And one girl was super honest and I loved it. And she said, you know what? I just don't want people in my school coming to my youth group. Like, this is my safe space. This is where I come and I know I'm okay. This is where I come And I'm like healed by the things that they have done to me. Why would I want them here? And I get it. Like, I honestly get it. It makes sense to me. But we cannot let our hearts stay in that place. You see, God said to Jonah, go and change the world. And his response was to go on holiday. The world was falling apart. And he was too busy making himself comfortable to do anything about it. Honestly, his life wasn't about them. It wasn't about God. It was about him. And I wonder, if we were really honest, are we so busy making ourselves comfortable that we're willing to let the world burn around us? I wonder if we are so focused on our own hearts, like honestly, if we're really honest with ourselves, that we don't let God close enough to hear him or to even break our hearts for other people because we're so busy looking at ourselves in the mirror. In Jonah 1, verses 4 to 7, right, Jonah gets on the boat, he goes to Tarshish, he loves it. Um, But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break the ship apart. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold, so the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this, he shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will pay attention to us and spare our lives. Then the crew cast lots to see which of them had offended. 
offended the gods and caused a terrible storm. When they did this, the lots identified Jonah as the culprit. So one of, for me, one of the most terrifying verses in the whole Bible, and I genuinely mean this, is verse 5. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the load. But all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. See, the thing that, that terrifies me is that there were people on that ship who understood the seriousness of the situation. They knew that they needed an answer bigger than themselves, a hope bigger than themselves. They knew something had to change. The problem was those people didn't know God. So they cried out to anything bigger than themselves to try to solve the problem that they could see in front of them. They cried out to whatever might bring hope while Jonah slept. And I wonder whether if you look around your friendship groups, people you know, If you can spot people who recognize that there is something wrong with this world, something wrong and broken in them, and all they're trying to do is cry out to something greater than themselves to solve the problem, heal the pain, but they don't know God, so they make something else a God. Whether it be getting into unhealthy relationships, whether it be um, looking incredible on, on TikTok, whether it be all kinds of different things, whether it be being mean, being angry to other people, it could be anything. But I believe our nation is full of people who know that something is wrong, but they don't know God, and so they're crying out to things that aren't God to heal the pain that is inside of them. And we, the people who know God, we sleep. You see, the person who should have known, the person who had perspective, who knew personally the bringer of hope and light, just slept through the situation. But that would never be us. I mean, imagine, right? Imagine if there was a massive, like, storm in our world, some sort of, like, huge controversy. Um, Imagine if there was, like, a global pandemic or a world war. Or imagine if our nation was in huge financial crisis. Or imagine if um, extreme poverty was on the up for the first time in 20 years. Or imagine if our government was a total mess. Just imagine, it's, you know, theoretically. And the people who knew hope, the people who knew Jesus, just slept. Didn't say anything, didn't do anything, didn't make a difference. And just watched as broken and hurting people tried to find an answer that was God, but they didn't know God around them. When I grew up, I grew up in Royal Leamington Spa. I love, yes, Leamington. Anyone love Leamington? I love Leamington. I nearly wore a t-shirt that said Leamington Spa on it tonight, and I thought maybe it's a bit much. Um, I love Leamington. Anyway, I grew up there. And there was a shop in Leamington as I was growing up that I absolutely loved. Um, it was where, like, all the cool people shopped, and it was way too expensive for me. So I just, like, walked around the shop every so often, hoping that I'd get cool by being in there. Um, and then this one birthday, I got some money. I got birthday money, and I thought, this is it. This is my chance. So I went into the shop, and the shop was, like, in a shopping centre. And I walked around, and I found these trousers that I loved. I was like, the moment has come. I'm going to be one of the cool people, and I'm going to wear some trousers that make me look epic. So I went into the shop, found these trousers, and I went into the changing room, and I thought, my moment has come. Maybe I'll be, like, cool by just soaking in the vibes, wearing the trousers. I went into the changing room, put the trousers on. I was in there for ages, just looking at myself in the mirror, imagining how cool I would be and how everyone would think I was wonderful. Uh, And I was wearing these trousers. I was in there for so long that someone actually came to the changing room door and knocked on the changing room door to try and get me out. And I was like, (laughs) I have waited for years for this moment. I'm not leaving this changing room. I was in there for ages. Anyway, after I'd been there for a while, I kind of noticed something wasn't right. Things were darker Not spiritually, just like, (laughs) oh dear, practically darker. Practically? Like the lights. The lights had gone. The lights had gone off. There were no lights. The lights had gone. And it had gone quiet. And I was like, it's the middle of the day. Something is not right here. So I've got these trousers on, right? And I, um, I open the changing room door, and I step out into the shop, and there's no one in there. Like, the lights are off. The shop's quiet. And I notice out of the shop window in the, um, the shopping arcade that everybody is exiting the shopping center. And suddenly, in the background, I'm aware I can hear a fire alarm. I'm like, oh, oh, well, I missed that crucial piece of information. And all of a sudden, I'm aware that I have two choices. Either 
I burn to death in my very cool trousers, possibly, or at least I risk it, or I lose all my pride and I <laughs> go to the shop door and I bang on it like my life depends on it and hope that someone will let me out of this shop. Uh, so naturally, I wasn't cool anyway, why start now? I went into the changing room, I rip off these trousers. I am not good under pressure, by the way. So I'm like trying to get the, I break the zip. So I never even got the trousers anyway. I didn't want to admit to breaking the zip. So I get the trousers, I get them off. I put my own trousers on, thankfully, didn't end that way. Run to the shop, and I'm like banging on the glass at the front of the shop. Um, someone goes and gets the shop manager. They let me out, and I have to do this walk of shame through the shopping center, being the child, like the teenager that was left in the shop to burn to death. And I'm kind of stood outside, I was like, I never went in the shop again. I never went in, I couldn't face it. But there was a moment back there where I was stood in front of the mirror, looking at my trousers, so taken in by what I wanted, my hopes, my dreams, my life, what I wanted to become, that literally, there was the sound of a fire alarm going off. There was the sound of a burning building around me. And I just didn't hear it. I just stood there, absorbed in myself, absorbed in my own world, and I was willing to let everything around me fall apart. I wonder, what will it take for God to wake you up? Jonah, classic, uh, ended up in a fish for three days. Um, but like, for you, what does it take for God to get your attention? For us, and I know we, we talked about surrender, we talked about it this morning, and, but it's something to say, I give it to you, God. And it's something for when we get home, for us not to be the center of our story anymore. He got in this fish. Well, he didn't get in it, did he? It's not like a car. He got swallowed by this fish, chucked overboard, swallowed by this fish. The fish spits him back out, right? And then God is so kind, so gracious, gives Jonah another chance. It says in Jonah 3, verses 1 to 4, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, Get up <clears throat> and go to the great city of Nineveh. Deliver the message I've given you. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large that it took three days to see it all. On the, on the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. What I love, right, is this should be, for Jonah, like the epic moment where it goes right. Where we're like, oh, Jonah's amazing. Let me, let me, let's just backtrack. <clears throat> so the initial message that God said to Jonah, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. What he actually says is he rocks up. By the way, <clears throat> I'm not good at maths. I'm not. But if it takes three days to cross Nineveh, it should at least take a day and a half to get to the middle of Nineveh. It says in the Bible, when Jonah arrived, on that first day, he got off his donkey or whatever and said this. That suggests he was like, technically I'm in Nineveh now. I've crossed the border. I'm just going to stand on the outskirts. And the, the message that he gives, quite frankly, is lame. The initial message that God says, here we go. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen it, how wicked its people are. What does he say? 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's it. That's all he's got. He doesn't even go to the middle of Nineveh. He goes to kind of the edge and says half of what he's meant to say. Quite frankly, he has a lame message. Um, and what he says is, is, is so poor and he says it in a place that doesn't carry weight. His attitude is so bad. <laughs> and his effort is so minimal. For Jonah, this is still about him. But what blows my mind about the presence of God, when we see God change lives and we see God, see God change nations, is that it doesn't need to be about us. It doesn't matter who we are, because it has always been about him. In Jonah 3, verses five to 10, it says, the people of Nineveh, despite the lame message, the people of Nineveh believe God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast, put on burlap, which is like this itchy material, to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne, took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap, sat on a heap of ashes, and then the king and his nobles sent the decree throughout the city, no one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps, even yet, God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done, 
and how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction that he had threatened. You know, when someone truly encounters the gospel, your objections to sharing the gospel and your objections to receiving the gospel, they look ridiculous. Because when someone truly encounters the gospel, kings get off their thrones. People remove themselves from the center of the story. It is no longer about us. It was always about God. Unless, of course, you're Jonah. <clears throat> now, the people of, of, of Nineveh understood something and that, that Jonah couldn't get his head around. The gospel, that God, his story, what he can do, the power of his presence was not about us. It was always been about him. And so I want to ask you, as we talk about God using you, as we talk about you going into your school, into your community, your sports groups, your, your friendship groups, secretly, like really secretly, is this still about you? Because if your objection to God being able to do something is can God use you, it's still about you. And this was never about you. It was always about him. On an average day, when you get up, what do you expect of God? Do you expect him to use you? Do you expect that he can use you? Or really, because really the story might mean that it's still all about you. And you being right with God and, and being innocent before God was never even about you. Your innocence before God and your right standing before God is 100% about the person of Jesus. It is all on Jesus. There is nothing you can do to, be, to make yourself more right with God. Jesus did it all. Even that is not about you. And so there's this incredible revival, incredible revival, where this entire city comes to know Jesus, um, comes to know God, because it was never about Jonah. It was always about God. And what I love is Jonah's response. I just want to read it to you because it's a classic. Here we go. Jonah 4 verses 1 to 3. This change of plans, by the way, change of plans is a destruction of 120,000 people, by the way. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah and he became very angry. So he complained about it to the Lord. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? This is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are merciful and a compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. Now, I don't want to be harsh, but for me, that's a bad attitude. God's response... Jonah 4 verse 4, the Lord replied, is it for you to be angry about this? Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? You know, when you really understand God's heart, God's heart for you and God's heart for them, it has to change everything in you. Even how you believe and view in and believe, even how you believe in and how you view yourself. You see, I look at revivals that have happened. I read incredible stories about moves of God, people who are amazing at prayer and amazing at seeing God move and so faithful and get stuff right. And I think I am not like them. Oh, but praise God, it was never about me. It was always about God. And frankly, I cling to the fact that the more unimpressive you are, the more God can do. And I am absolutely delighted with that fact. Right. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, sure, great. Do you know what? If you got that this wasn't about you, how good you are or you aren't, how great a Christian you are or you aren't, but if this was really about understanding what God did for you and how much other people need it, and that was your main focus, then I wonder whether we would see God do something in our nation. You see, you, if you follow Jesus in here tonight, you have eternity. That's it, you've got it. You've got eternity in the bag. You have eternity to play with, endless resource. And so why would you not give the 70 to 80 years that you are on this earth to giving absolutely everything to him? because this has nothing to do with you. Nineveh had 120,000 people in it, look what God did. The UK 
has 67.4 million people living in it. What might God do for them if we got serious about who God is, what he's done for us, and what God could do for them? (sighs) If this is about revival, guys, it can't be about us anymore. It has to be about him. It has to be about them. I want you guys to know, and I will close with this, that this, seeing people come to know Jesus, seeing our nation transformed, seeing our world come out of the absolute mess that it's in, it's the adventure that you were created for. The question is, will you choose to sleep through it or will you wake up and say, this is our time, not because of me, but because of who my God is. If you're able, can I invite you to stand to your feet, please? And we're going to respond. So if we could, like, keep quiet, that would be amazing. Let's not distract each other. Because I believe that God might want to do something here tonight. He might want to stir something in some people. So could I ask you, um, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. There's nothing, like, crazy about closing your eyes. It just means, for a start, the person next to you will probably try not to talk to you if your eyes are shut. Um, If they do, just hit them in the face. Also, if your eyes are closed, you won't get distracted. I want to invite you to put your hands out in front of you as well. And again, there's absolutely nothing magical about this. It just means you're not on your phone. It means you're not like messing with stuff. And it's, it's actually an outward expression of what's going on with us inwardly, saying, God, I want to hear from you tonight. Would you do something in me? So we're just going to have some quiet for a minute. And we're going to wait. And we're going to see what God does.